Sydney Blumenthal, interview, take one, marker. Okay, give us one moment to settle, Barrack, and it's all yours. Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky, which was a slave state. And uh, his father, Thomas, was a poor dirt farmer. He was uh, the, at the low end of his family. Uh, his um, half-brother had inherited a lot of money, but he got nothing. And uh, he was essentially driven out of Kentucky through um, thievery of his land and by being forced to compete for wages with slaves who were put out for hire for almost nothing. And they went across the um, Ohio River to Indiana, a free state. Lincoln later said that slave states are places for poor white people to remove themselves from, and free states are places for free white people to go to. So the beginning of Lincoln's uh, education begins with his family's migration out of uh, Kentucky. Um, as it happened, his parents belonged to a primitive Baptist church that was led by a uh, what was called an emancipationist preacher. So that was somewhat unusual uh, in um, the early part of the 19th century in Kentucky, but the family was anti-slavery. And Lincoln later said, I uh, am naturally anti-slavery. He didn't unpack his whole family history, but what he meant by it was that it was natural to him. And it, in fact, came to him from his uh, family. When he came to uh, uh, Illinois at the age of 21, he separated himself from his um, father and his stepmother and his stepbrothers and this whole family that had migrated again from Indiana into Illinois. Uh, he was at 21, free white, and 21. Um, until that time, he had been, um, in effect, an indentured servant to his father, who had been hired out for uh, labor and uh, wages, which his father took. And later in his life, in the year in which he became a Republican, having founded the Illinois Republican Party, at a rally, he said, jokingly, I used to be a slave, um, but now they let me practice the law. But he did think of himself as having been a slave, and he resented it. And um, there's an important aspect to that in terms of his empathy. If you read his speeches and his um, messages, they often are very, very different from uh, the uh, rhetoric of abolitionists. And they're different in an important way. They're different because some of them are from the point of view of the slave. The abolitionists rarely took the point of view of the slave. They attempted to arouse outrage at the slave's condition and sympathy and even tears. But Lincoln took the point of view of the slave. Uh, and in one of his um, more elaborate statements, he talked about how all the powers of Earth had conspired against the slave to put him in his cell, held there um, by a key that was then dispersed by a with a hundred keys to a hundred different men in a hundred different locations, held in, in, and then he described the system of power that was constructed upon that, that held this slave in his cell. Now, Lincoln was not talking abstractly. In this case, at the very time he gave that speech, he had been the lawyer for a free black woman from Springfield. There was a free black community in Springfield, and Lincoln was well aware of it. A block away from his house uh, lived a black man. Lincoln lived in what we would call a mixed neighborhood today. 
um, and the black man um, was at one point arrested for being part of the Underground Railroad. Um, Lincoln ha had all kinds of cases, and he um, is said to have represented uh, fugitive slaves. He certainly um, gave permission to his law partner, William Henry Herndon, to represent fugitive slaves in cases to protest. But in, in this one special case, there was a woman named Polly who came to him was a free black woman. Uh, he represented her as the lawyer. And her son, who was a free black man, had gone down the Mississippi on a boat. Um, he had reached New Orleans and been arrested, and either his, his free papers were taken away or had been lost, and he was about to be sold into slavery and she wanted to know what to do. Now this, for Lincoln, brought back, must have brought back memories of the times, the two times he had been in New Orleans as a very young man taking um, hogs and grain down the Mississippi there, uh, and described by his cousin who accompanied him as having been shocked by the sights and sounds of slavery um, surrounding him in New Orleans, including slave auctions in the streets. Uh, he was appalled by what he saw. He must have been shocked, uh, this um, you know, provincial uh, boy from Illinois. Uh, so here's, here's what happens in this case. Um, Lincoln uh, writes the governor of Louisiana, and uh, his, his protest is denied. He goes and sees the governor of Illinois. He's the first uh, Republican elected governor. In fact, he's somebody Lincoln slated as governor. And the governor says, there's nothing I can do. Louisiana won't do anything. So there was only one thing Lincoln could do, and that was he had to pay the exorbitant fine, in effect, buying this young man's freedom. Uh, in fact, buying somebody who would have been a slave. And so Lincoln sold his own insurance policy to raise the money because he could not raise the money completely in the community. And he paid it himself. Um, so when he spoke about all the powers of earth conspired against the slave locked in a cell, he had in mind a particular man who he emancipated with his own money. In 1858, Lincoln is running for the Senate against his longtime rival, Stephen A. Douglas, the incumbent senator. At last, he's getting a chance to challenge him face to face. Uh, he announces his candidacy in the Illinois House of Representatives. It's called the Hall of Representatives in the old state capitol with a speech in which he says, a house divided against itself cannot stand half slave, half free. He also says that uh, sl um, slavery will be put on the course of ultimate extinction. He says he does not know how this will happen, but he says the country, the nation, will become all one thing or all the other. Uh, Lincoln's advisors, for the most part, it, tell him not to deliver this speech. It's far too radical. Uh, only his law partner, who's um, uh, a radical, Herndon, tells him it's okay to do this. But Lincoln does this. Um, his rhetoric is derived from the Gospels of a house divided, but it's applied to the country. Um, this is considered to be a very a radical statement at the time. And it was held against Lincoln all the way through. And even in the statements um, and, uh, and the secession that took place in uh, South Carolina, uh, Lincoln is denounced for having spoken about a house divided, uh, half slave, half free, and putting the country on the course of, putting slavery on the course of um, ultimate extinction. And that is given as one of the reasons for uh, secession. L Lincoln at that time, is, uh, has created um, the Illinois uh, State Republican Party. He is its leader. 
He is their candidate for the Senate. Um, it has one plank. Uh, it is opposed to the extension of slavery in the territories. He is determined that um, additional planks not be added because it will fracture this tenuous coalition. So even though he is appalled at um, the uh, arrests and return of fugitive slaves, he is against having um, a, a fugitive slave plank, an opposition to it, as part of the platform because it will alienate uh, many of the conservatives and the whole party will then lose and be unable to achieve its basic program. He's trying to hold this together. He calls uh, uh, the, uh, the, the federal government going after fugitive slaves ungodly. But he writes a letter to Salmon Chase, the governor of Ohio, who's uh, some, something of a radical on, um, on abolitionism, to please not allow uh, opposition to fugitive uh, uh, slave, uh, the, uh, the um, capturing fugitive slaves to become part of an official Republican program because it will destroy the ability of the Republican Party to deal with anything. So Lincoln is, um, is early on uh, engaged in um, a, a juggling act. Lincoln has been a tightrope walker for years ever since he created the uh, Illinois Republican Party, trying to hold together its um, tenuous coalition of people who in the past hated each other, members of other parties and movements and causes, and have different views on how to deal with slavery. And only one plank will hold them together, opposition to the extension of slavery. So he is determined to keep that straight and narrow path um, uh, unblemished by um, other um, issues. So Lincoln has to walk um, across this tightrope and having set his foot on it, he doesn't know where the other side ends. And he has to keep walking it, as far as he knows, forever. Fort Sumter is um, a U.S. Army base uh, that is located on an island in Charleston Harbor. The Army garrison has fled under cover of night on Christmas Eve from Fort Moultrie on land to Fort Sumter, but being an island that must be resupplied. So the question is, Will Lincoln send ships into Charleston Harbor under the, uh, the, uh, under the cannon of the new Confederacy in order to uh, supply the men in that fort? By, here's the dilemma. This is federal property. If Lincoln abandons it, then the Confederacy will take that as a tacit uh, admission of recognition of its sovereignty over that territory. But if he resupplies it, the question is, is he precipitating a conflict and acting recklessly? And there is great uh, dissension around him about what to do. His new Secretary of State, his former rival for the Republican nomination, William Seward, is giving orders um, without to, to withdraw ships supplying uh, Fort Sumter without informing the president. And Lincoln um, is uh, unsure at, of what to do. And then, and an advisor, a wise man in Washington, comes to see him, Francis P. Blair. We're familiar with Blair House across from the White House. Well, that was occupied by Francis P. Blair, Francis Preston Blair, who was brought to Washington, as 
just about everyone is brought to Washington for political reasons by Andrew Jackson and his kitchen cabinet to edit a pro-Jackson party partisan newspaper. And he stayed. And he had sons, and they had influence in Maryland, where they, where they lived, and in Missouri, where part of the family lived. Uh, and the sons were very political and capable. Montgomery Blair, who Lincoln named his postmaster general, and Frank Blair Jr., who became a general from Missouri. And Blair says to Lincoln that he has to have a stiff back like Jackson, and he has to um, resist the uh, call to give in to the Confederacy. Blair has a memory, and what is the memory? It's a memory of a past incident. It's the nullification crisis of the early 1830s in which um, South Carolinians um, led by John C. Calhoun and the governor uh, of uh, South Carolina, James Hamilton, sought to defy President Jackson um, uh, on uh, federal law and claimed that as a state they could nullify federal law at will. Jackson um, sent federal troops, stationed them at the forts around Charleston, and issued a proclamation against nullification, calling it treasonous and asserting that the federal government had uh, authority over the states given the constitutional basis of um, the uh, federal union having created the states rather than being a compact of states as though they were separate nations. Lincoln now has that proclamation of nullification on his desk that he is consulting. And he has the living figure of nullification of that crisis sitting with him and telling him that um, he must act like Jackson to uphold the Federal Union. And, um, and Lincoln decides to send the supply ship. And as a result of that, the uh, Confederates decide that they will shell it and shell Fort Sumter. Nobody was prepared to fight a protracted war. Lincoln was not. Lincoln, like almost everybody else, believed that there would be in the beginning one major battle, it would resolve the issue, the war would be over, and that would be the end of it. But after the uh, first battle of Bull Run, a chaotic uh, fiasco, Lincoln realizes not only has the Union lost this battle, but it will take more than one battle. And he also realizes, observing the uh, disorganization of the troops um, and their poor training and how many of them fled the field, that he actually does not have a disciplined, organized army, and he has to have one. And he also realizes he doesn't have a general who can do that, and he has to find a general. So Lincoln is beginning from scratch after Bull Run. It seems in retrospect that um, somehow these events are moving slowly because we read about them. But in real time, they're happening with great rapidity. And um, events are just falling upon Lincoln. Um, and he is um, responding to them. Um, Lincoln later said, um, I have not controlled events. Events have controlled me. And this is one of those occasions where Lincoln is um, trying to uh, figure out what to do. Um, and uh, he's in the midst of um, chaos. Um, so um, this is when he discovers General George Brinton McClellan, who will organize the Army of the Potomac. And from virtually nothing, with the United States not having an, uh, a real organized, trained army, um, the Union Army is 
almost spontaneously generated from all of these volunteers and whipped into shape and trained and trained and trained and trained to Lincoln's impatience. We think a lot about what Lincoln's strategies were, but we always have to remember that Lincoln is also responding to the Confederate strategies, and they have strategies. And Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, has a strategy too. And the ultimate point of his strategy is to win recognition internationally of the Confederacy, particularly from England, the greatest power in the world, which has the English Navy which is um, uh, unsurpassable in its, um, in its mobility and power. So the question is, how can he win that recognition? Europe, after the failed revolutions of 1848, is, um, is ruled by um, reaction. It's ruled by um, conservative uh, monarchs who've returned to the throne. Um, who were opposed to um, the revolutions of liberalism that happened um, and are determined to suppress them. Uh, so the Habsburgs are on the, th on the throne in Austria-Hungary. Um, and uh, in France, uh, uh, Louis, uh, Napoleon is on the throne. And in Italy, um, uh, the Pope, Pope Pius IX, is completely hostile to the United States, um, seeing it as uh, the source of wickedness and evil in the world, uh, and explicitly issues something that he calls the Syllabus of Errors in 1864, denouncing the United States um, as a source of, and he says it, liberalism, the enemy of godliness. So the question is England. None of them can act without England. And uh, England is divided on the question. In, uh, some of the uh, mill owners and the aristocracy, the mill owners connected to the cotton trade in the South, um, and the aristocracy are hostile to the United States and to Lincoln. But there are other forces in, in, in England that are sympathetic. Lincoln himself establishes a relationship with the liberal leader of the parliament, John Bright. Uh, and John Bright becomes more or less the member of parliament from the United States in the House of Commons and constantly makes the case. He and Lincoln correspond. Um, and when Lincoln was assassinated, by the way, he had on him a clipping of a speech by John Bright. Um, when Lincoln says in his um, second message to the Congress that um, the United States is the last best hope of Earth, what he means is, and is that the United States is the only <coughs> liberal democratic republic in Western civilization, and it is under siege from all of these powers. All the powers of reaction are determined to overthrow and defeat the United States under Lincoln's leadership and wish that the Confederacy would win. So the Confederate strategy and diplomacy is all aimed at that. That is why um, Lee, with the Army of Northern Virginia, is set into the North to invade twice, hoping for a decisive vic victory that will turn England and uh, lead to recognition. If uh, the Confederacy is recognized, what happens? Well then, the trade between England and the Confederacy is uh, completely legal. And the Union blockade in England's eyes can be taken as an act of war if it stops English ships, which might even lead to a conflict. Let us not forget 
that Canada is under the control of the English and that it is um, uh, a nest for the Confederacy and a place where the Confederates established a center for what become terrorist operations against the North. And the Canadian authorities, under English control, um, permit this. So Canada is not a hospitable place to the United States uh, either. Um, so Lincoln has a very difficult uh, diplomatic and geostrategic uh, situation facing him. And everything he does has in the background not only his great goal of preserving the United States as the last best hope of Earth, but in order to do that, to prevent the recognition by England of the Confederacy. There is a photograph um, taken by um, the great photographer Matthew Brady, with whom Lincoln has an interesting and long relationship, of Lincoln in McClellan's tent conferring. Lincoln is um, furious with McClellan for not having pressed uh, the campaign uh, swiftly against um, the southern forces, but instead plottingly moved down the peninsula and eventually stopping and then putting the Union Army um, into a, its bivouac uh, and um, ending the campaign, the greatest army ever fielded in numbers, equipment, the greatest naval armada, all of it ending in nothing. But there's another, there's an undercurrent there too, because McClellan is completely hostile to uh, any acts towards emancipation and uh, even uh, the confiscation acts of using uh, slaves for uh, labor for the Union forces and treating them as though they were not slaves, which is, of course, the road to emancipation. Um, he's completely hostile to all of this. Um, and Lincoln is very aware of this. Uh, McClellan um, uh, is very intent on telling Lincoln of his political objections to emancipation. We don't know what they're saying in that tent. Um, we, we don't, we're not privy to that conversation. There were a number of conversations. But um, we are aware at least of what was unsaid and the undercurrents of uh, mistrust and resentment between these two men. The end of uh, 1861, um, there is a large party at the White House. McClellan's invited, the decorations are incredible. Um, and McClellan has trained this vast Union Army, the Army of the Potomac, but they have not done anything. They're in winter quarters. And um, Lincoln has lost a battle, the Battle of Bull Run, um, and his standing is not particularly high. There's a lot of criticism of him um, from those who insist he declare um, the abolition of slavery uh, without having won any victories. He has um, uh, no control by the end of 1861 of the West. The victories of Grant, this obscure general, Ulysses S. Grant, are yet to come at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. We have not yet fought the Battle of Shiloh. Um, nothing secure. Uh, Lincoln is worried about the border states. He's worried about uh, Kentucky. He's worried about Missouri. Um, everything is um, unsettled. Everything is uh, disordered. And um, there's a lot of criticism also of his Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, who um, has um, been given this job 
uh, on the basis of a, a pledge at the convention when the Pennsylvania delegation went for Lincoln. Uh, and Simon Cameron, a longtime and very wealthy uh, Pennsylvania politician, uh, uh, is, has a reputation of um, crookedness and um, uh, has a lot of baggage. Uh, and he is uh, managerially uh, not competent. So there's a lot of trouble in the cabinet as well. It's hard for us to imagine um, uh, now with uh, the White House surrounded by fences and security forces and gates that it was an open place even in the Civil War and that ordinary people could simply walk up to the White House um, unannounced and walk in and then say what they wanted to do and that they wanted to meet the president. All kinds of people showed up, people who wanted pardons, people who especially wanting patronage jobs, um, people with complaints, um, uh, crazy people, uh, famous people, uh, all kinds of people. It's extraordinary that Lincoln got anything done uh, uh, given um, the constant flood of humanity that was flowing through the White House at that time. Well, I know that uh, Donald Trump has said that um, his poll numbers were greater than Lincoln's, but uh, the truth is there were no poll numbers <laughs> in, uh, for Lincoln. There were no polls. So how did Lincoln know what the public thought? How did he assess it? S Lincoln was uh, a very experienced politician, and he knew the public from um, many uh, angles. He knew them as a lawyer. He knew them uh, as juries. Uh, he knew them as a, beginning as a state legislature later. Um, he knew them on, uh, on, the, on campaigns. Um, and um, he was very eager to meet people, to learn what they had to say, and to analyze it. He studied um, voting t uh, results. He knew how counties voted around the country. Um, he was as um, shrewd and knowledgeable as any politico of his age, but he really loved his public opinion baths, his big meetings with people where um, they would just talk and he would listen. Um, and he, he got more out of it than they did. Um, he was able to assimilate um, this kind of information. Lincoln was also somebody who was an, an unusually astute observer of human nature. He had seen it in all of its forms on the frontier. Uh, and um, he had seen all kinds of people um, and was familiar with the wildest characters uh, from, um, from con men to to you know, Bible thumping preachers, to from um, from poor people to wealthy people, um, he was familiar with um, you know bankers and the wealthiest people in Illinois, and he was familiar with P.T. Barnum. So um, and he learned a lot, and he learned from everybody, and he wanted to hear what they had to say, um, and he, it gave him a sense of what, of the essence of politics, the art of the possible. And without that, nothing could be achieved. The death of uh, Willie Lincoln is a major event in Lincoln's life and presidency, in his marriage, in his family. Um, he certainly loved that boy. Um, and um, he had already lost um, a son, um, uh, Edward, in uh, Illinois. 
who had died as a, as a child. And to lose Willie while he was president was a, a terrific blow against him. Uh, it took Mary, uh, his wife, a, a long time, if ever, to recover. Um, and she sequestered herself in grief and mourning. Um, Lincoln had to um, continue. He had to go on, um, regardless of um, his mourning. Now, Lincoln is somebody who wasn't just afflicted with what at that time was called melancholy, what we, we might call depression. As a young man, um, he had had suicidal incidents. Um, he uh, may have had manic incidents, um, but he had learned uh, extraordinarily how to control himself. And self-discipline at every level, uh, emotionally, politically, and intellectually, was very much his essence. And it required a great deal from him to do that. Um, not only because of his past, and not only because of the awful tragedies that befell him, but the horrific circumstances and urgency of them in which he found himself. Probably the person who spent the most time with Lincoln, who wrote about Lincoln, um, before he became president, was his law partner, uh, William Henry Herndon, who um, found Lincoln, of course, warm, humorous, but also distant, sometimes cold, and at certain moments um, completely abstracted, staring um, um, in what appeared to be into the distance but into himself for long periods of time. Um, and Lincoln was working things out. Lincoln spent a lot of time both consciously and unconsciously working on himself and on what he had to deal with. Um, so Lincoln's a, a strange person to be with. Um, he's somebody who wants to, if you're with a room of men, who wants to entertain them, he wants to tell them stories, he wants to draw them in, and yet in some ways they feel he's unreachable. And he makes his own decisions. What's in, also interesting about that is that at the end of the day, he is the one who decides. Um, he decides on the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, he does this in a, in a very lonely way and works it all out himself uh, before he confides in cabinet members one by one that he is going to proceed with this. So Lincoln is... Um, an isolated man in the midst of, of many people. I would say that uh, Lincoln is fundamentally um, introverted uh, rather than uh, extroverted. Um, while he wants to win people over, he doesn't have a psychological need for that. He can exist on his own. Now, in the period of his wilderness, when he was out of politics, he, you know, he, he became a uh, prosperous, well-to-do lawyer, not excessively wealthy, but he did well in central Illinois. Um, and he said, I almost gave up thought of politics, which I don't believe. Nonetheless, um, you know, Lincoln, um, had resolved himself. He had, um, he, had, he had felt that he could live this life if he had to. It wasn't the life he really wanted to lead. Um, and then politics opened up another path for him. So Lincoln is somebody who thinks a lot about persuading people, 
convincing people what their natures are, who they are. He's looking into them. Um, and at the same time, he's keeping his distance and working things out on his own. Three slaves escape from um, a southern control near Fort Monroe. They escape into Fort Monroe. Um, they are going to be used for labor there to help the Confederate Army. The general, uh, General Benjamin Butler, decides uh, not to uh, give them back. He does not treat them as fugitive slaves. He does not recognize the Federal uh, Fugitive Slave Act to return it to this hostile a power the Confederacy. Instead, he decides that since the Confederacy and the South calls slave labor property, human property, it should be treated under the rules of war as property and confiscated. But that puts the slaves in a different um, category, a kind of purgatory. Um, they're not fully emancipated, but they're not really slaves. So what is to be done? This uh, uh, triggers a, a cascade of events that leads to a debate within the Congress. And the Congress passes the first Confiscation Act, which um, states that um, uh, those slaves that are captured by the Union Army or make their way within Union lines um, are no longer to be considered as slaves, but to be put to work for the Union cause. And that is the beginning of a process that over time will cascade again and again and again and lead to emancipation. You know, today we talk about people having agency, um, the ability to um, act on their own uh, and ex express their purposes. But that phrase existed then. Um, and um, it was understood that the slaves who had gone into the Union lines had agency of their own. And they were creating facts on the ground that had to be dealt with. Horace uh, uh, Greeley, with whom Lincoln has had um, by this time a long relationship. Um, Greeley is an eccentric uh, and very influential editor of the New York Tribune, the leading, one of the leading national newspapers in the country, and uh, an anti-slavery newspaper. Writes a letter um, urging Lincoln uh, to issue um, some sort of a proclamation of emancipation. Lincoln has already decided he's going to do this. He has already told um, confidentially uh, certain members of his cabinet he's going to do this. Lincoln um, finds this letter to be a very convenient political occasion for him to help prepare public opinion for what he's about to do so that the public understands that his hand was forced on emancipation and that a conservative public must understand that uh, he had to do it in order to win the war out of military necessity. And so he's, and that it serves the greater cause that they support of the Union. And so he says, if I could uh, save the Union without freeing the slaves, I would do so. If I could save the Union freeing the slaves, I would do so. He's already decided on the latter. So he is um, uh, telling the public, um, look how open I am to this, um, look how prudent I am, uh, how conservative I am. Um, but he well knows that Greeley is actually giving him a platform to appeal to these conservatives, to bring them along to the goal that Greeley and the radical ab abolitionists like, even as they criticize uh, Lincoln. There are moments in, uh, in this period where Lincoln tells certain abolitionists to publicly criticize him, to organize meetings, where he makes statements and says, um, 
to uh, conservatives, well, look how much criticism I'm getting. And um, so, um, you know, Lincoln um, is um, using Greeley uh, for his um, greater purposes. Lincoln uh, has a great sense of timing. Uh, and um, he says, I, I may be slow, but I never take a step back. And he doesn't want to take a step back because that means that uh, what he has done has been defeated. He wants things to be ripened. He has a, a, a parable about a pear tree that ripens. And when the fruit is ready to fall, then it should be harvested. And before then, it would be ruined. So Lincoln um, thinks a lot about what the political moment is and what the political forces are and where public opinion is. Um, he, he worries about um, issuing an Emancipation Proclamation at the wrong time um, it, uh, and whether or not it's sustainable. The worst thing that could have happened is to have issued one in an unsustainable political situation, and that was one of Lincoln's fears. When Lincoln says we cannot escape history, and he says the dogmas of the past are inadequate to the stormy present, um, he also says later in it that um, uh, freeing the slaves will free us. This is very much about slavery. And when he says we cannot escape history, it is our history. So think of, and, and it is in this message that he talks about the United States as the last best hope of Earth. So think about it. He is, he is talking about the United States as the shining example to the world, uh, holding up the uh, beacon of liberty, and at the same time that we cannot escape our own history, our own past, the weight of slavery. And in order to become this last best hope, we have to deal with um, our own past, um, or else we will not be what we claim to be in the future. Lincoln believes that this is about saving the Union, and, um, and ending slavery and defeating the slave power and destroying the slave power, which is a, a, um, a formidable economic and political entity that has come to be called the Confederacy. And before that, his election, before his election, had controlled the federal government. So these things are not um, unentangled. They are uh, all of a piece. Um, and in order to save the Union, he must end slavery. Uh, and um, he, it's not that he has come to that conclusion. It is that he reaches his action on it at the politically propitious moment when it can be sustained and as the events unfold, which he can, could not foresee as they were happening. The Emancipation Proclamation is um, uh, the greatest expropriation of private property in the history of mankind um, uh, to that moment. It is um, unimaginable um, and um, in 1864, an artist named Francis Carpenter comes to the White House. He's somebody who has uh, painted portraits of presidents in the past. He's painted the portrait of Franklin Pierce. And he tells Lincoln, I want to paint a grand painting of the moment when you are deciding to um, sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, it is the greatest moment in human history. Um, certainly Frederick Douglass felt that. 
um, and many people in the United States um, uh, uh, felt that this was um, a transformation of the very idea of the United States. And Lincoln himself calls it a new birth of freedom at, um, at Gettysburg. Lincoln uh, brings in Carpenter, who lives in the White House for six months, painting this, uh, this portrait. And, um, and uh, he writes um, a book about it called Six Months at the White House. Um, the painting itself uh, now hangs in the U.S. Senate. Uh, it shows Lincoln with his cabinet. Um, the book, in my opinion, is better than the painting, but the um, it because it it, it it records conversations with Lincoln in, um, as events are happening, including Lincoln's reflections on uh, how he came to uh, issue the Emancipation Proclamation and how he had to deal with military defeats with. Um, um, uh, obstinate and difficult generals, uh, with um, uh, events that had turned against him, uh, and uh, uh, political circumstances that were very unstable and uneasy. The Emancipation Proclamation declares that slavery will end when the war ends and the, um, and the United States is victorious. And it does have a practical effect, because wherever the Union Army is in the South, beyond the Confiscation Acts, um, it is an army of liberation, an army of deliverance. And the word spreads. Um, and it, the nature of the war has been explicitly transformed. Um, it is uh, a war the, to end slavery, um, which is the fundamental economic basis of the American South and the Confederacy. And according to the Confederate Constitution, its very reason for being. And what Lincoln has said is that that very reason for being will be made, you know, it is, and henceforth and forever ended. The role of photography in the Civil War um, is uh, the first time that images of warfare make their way into public view. This has never happened before. Um, now, the, Brady sends uh, a corps of photographers at his own expense, which in the end bankrupts him um, and ruins him financially, um, out onto the battlefields. And they um, take pictures of uh, the horrific consequences of the battles. Um, and um, these were not, these photographs did not appear in the newspapers. But they were shown at one point in a gallery in New York. And uh, the public mobbed them. And they wanted to see what the war was really like. I don't have the slightest um, doubt that Lincoln saw these photographs. Um, he was in and out of the photographic studios of Alexander Gardner, who had been um, Brady's lead photographer and gone off and created his own studio in um, Washington. Uh, many of the most famous portraits of Lincoln were made by Gardner. It's sittings at his studio. And um, he, he had all the photos. There's no question, there could be no question that Lincoln saw what happened on these battlefields. Not just heard them, not just read reports, um, not just heard eyewitnesses, um, and not just saw drawings, but saw the photographs. And for the first time, um, the horrors of war in their full reality were brought to him and to the people at, at large. Lincoln and Mary uh, visited many of the hospitals um, around uh, Washington. 
um, and uh, visited with the wounded so uh, soldiers. The wounds were ho are horrific. Um, let's remember that one of the nurses was somebody whose name was Walt Whitman, who um, uh, was so shattered by the experience that he eventually had to leave Washington. Um, just the day-to-day -day, um, uh, uh, experience of seeing uh, these young men and their condition was shattering. And um, Lincoln spent a good deal of time. Um, medicine, from our point of view, was primitive. Um, and um, there were a lot of amputations. Um, germ theory did not exist. Um, Lincoln, uh, however, believed in public health uh, and was uh, a major supporter of what was called the Sanitary uh, uh, Commission. It was the beginning of the, um, of the Red Cross um, and uh, what became the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, all of that begins in the, in the Civil War, and Lincoln was very scientifically uh, minded and uh, open to um, any scientific advance um, in medicine. Uh, Lee had brought his army uh, for the second invasion of the North into uh, Pennsylvania. Um, nobody chose that battlefield. It happened through the collision of forces. And um, it was a decisive defeat for the Confederacy in his second invasion. Uh, Lee was uh, hoping for um, a victory that would bring about, he hoped, English recognition of the Confederacy. It was, uh, if he had won a great battle in the North, the idea was that England might recognize the Confederacy. Furthermore, uh, Lee and the Confederates were trying to destabilize Lincoln politically, um, going into uh, his reelection campaign. And if they could um, uh, upset Lincoln so that he was defeated politically, then they believed they could win that way. Um, if the um, Democrats, who were heavily influenced by the Copperheads or Peace Democrats that favored um, recognition of the Confederacy uh, would uh, prevail, then that would be a victory too for the Confederacy. So Lee had um, great strategic purposes in this invasion and they were repelled. Lee survived and the army of um, Northern Virginia survived. Lincoln was uh, enraged at uh, General Meade that he didn't pursue uh, Lee uh, and felt that uh, he could have uh, achieved the destruction of, of the Confederate force. Um, nonetheless, it was the end of the invasions um, of the North and um, the Confederacy was in a, um, a an a downward spiral militarily um, in terms of um, manpower especially. It was a war of attrition. The, the North had endless sources of manpower and every battle that Lee fought and lost and lost men meant that they were irreplaceable. And so the balance of military power tipped and it especially tipped after that battle. Uh, Lincoln was invited to uh, deliver the uh, dedication to the military cemetery at Gettysburg. There was another speaker, Edward Everett, who had been the former everything, um, from president of Harvard University to governor of Massachusetts to secretary of state. Um, and was known as the greatest orator of his day. In the old-fashioned uh, style of uh, Victorian Shakespearean um, actors who hold forth forever, um, uh, 
Lincoln uh, came to Gettysburg on a train. Um, he was accompanied by Seward, and uh, uh, he reached Gettysburg. Um, and uh, we know that he famously spoke for a very short period of time. To me, Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address uses uh, his touchstone of the Declaration of Independence as the basis of um, the founding of the American Republic. And he dedicates the, this cemetery and the entire Union cause to the idea of the Declaration, all men are created equal. But it, he is not backward looking. Um, this, is a, this is a living uh, document that t Lincoln is central to the Constitution and also forward looking. And on that basis, he declares through this sacrifice that there has been a new birth of freedom. This is, um, in its own way, a discussion on Lincoln's part of um, crucifixion and resurrection. And it is not, not simply the soldiers themselves who have um, undergone that process, but the nation. The nation is surrounded by um, death and suffering. And what's the purpose? And um, the purpose is um, for this greater cause and for these higher principles uh, and for a belief that all men are created equal, which is why we have this particular nation. And uh, on the basis of having waged this struggle, something new has emerged. And it is this nation built on an enduring principle, but it has become in a peculiarly American way, a new nation, a new birth of freedom. And that is what the Civil War has become for Lincoln and which he expresses in his distilled language. Lincoln knew what it was, uh, what, what the war was being fought for, and there are elements of the Gettysburg Address that have been part of Lincoln's um, um, constitution, his personal being, um, for decades. Um, the phrase of the people, by the people, and for the people has its origins in a famous oration by Daniel Webster. Uh, uh, in his second reply to Hayne in the Congress, in which uh, Webster defines the federal union as opposed to the states' rights uh, version of the Constitution. And Lincoln knows this by heart. He has committed Webster's peroration to memory long ago when he was a young man. Um, and it comes to him again. Um, in the writing of this speech. And he has put together um, um, ideas that are n not second nature to him, but in the forefront of his mind, um, and have been all along, that he wants to express at this moment. And particularly at, um, um, at, at a cemetery, um, at a uh, psalm place. Um, where so many have uh, given their lives, and to explain what their sacrifice has been and what the suffering of the nation has been for a higher cause. Well, Lincoln's um, language is um, always uh, plain and lucid. Um, it, um, it lacks um, a lot of the errors of um, some speeches, it's not um, vague. They probably did not know that this would be one of the um, speeches uh, that would endure in American history and wind up with the second inaugural being engraved in a Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall. They did not know that. Um, the first publication of what was called uh, 
the Gettysburg Address was of Edward Everett's speech and didn't, did not include Lincoln's. So that was the original Gettysburg Address, was the Iliad-length Everett speech and not Lincoln's brief words. So um, uh, it was printed in the newspapers. People congratulated him. Some people recognized the concision um, and um, how deep it went um, at the time. Um, it really was not until it was included in um, school uh, textbooks later that um, ordinary Americans um, would uh, see this as part of um, the national canon. And uh, school children memorized it from McGuffey's Reader. My grandfather had a McGuffey's Reader that I inherited, and it had the Gettysburg Address in it. Second inaugural is a speech with many purposes. It is um, it is a it is theological. It is national. It is political. It is um, it is a lawyer's refutation. It is many things at once, um, without ever stating that. Um, it is a refutation of the, uh, particularly on Lincoln's part as a forensic lawyer, of the Confederate uh, case for slavery and the war. Um, it is a refutation of the idea that um, uh, the North and the Union were responsible for the war. At, by not allowing the Confederacy to um, just go on its merry way. It is um, a refutation of the idea that slavery was not at the um, bottom of the reasons for the war, that it was not the cause of the war. It is a refutation of um, Southern theology that justified slavery. It is all of these things at once. This is. Um, Lincoln the lawyer making a case, and it's his um, greatest case. The, con uh, the Confederates always claimed that God was on their side and that God um, had um, a decreed slavery, that it was eternal. It was in the Bible. There were many, many um, uh, books written before uh, the war by Southern theologians um, uh, justifying slavery on the basis of the Bible. And um, Lincoln says, um, we don't know what's on God's mind. Both sides claimed um, uh, God's blessing in the war. But we do know what has happened here. And, um, uh, we knew, and um, in describing the end of slavery, um, which he, as president and the Union Army, had brought about, um, he ascribes it to the judgments of the Lord, true and righteous altogether. And um, those judgments of the Lord then sit upon, the, um, without saying it, the sinfulness of slavery and, and the Confederacy for having uh, uh, put the nation through this bloody conflict in order to preserve it. And he has turned um, theology um, that the Confederates had waived. And remember, the Confederate Constitution claims God. And there is no mention in the United States Constitution of God. Um, and Lincoln turns it um, against the very basis of the Confederacy, which is slavery. Lincoln loved going to the theater. The theater for religious people at the time was considered to be um, um, to be somewhat sinful, and the theater was considered to be the workshop of the devil. Um, actors and actresses were low-life people. They they were not refined. Um, but Lincoln loved it. He loved Shakespeare. 
especially. Um, and he loved to speak with actors. Um, he liked to meet them. Um, and he even met Edwin Booth a number of times, including a dinner at uh, Seward's house. Um, and they were very uh, friendly. And Booth was a, Edwin Booth, a major supporter of the Union and of Lincoln. Um, another motive for his rebellious younger brother. Um, um, Lincoln uh, was told not to go to the theater um, by many people, who, some who feared for his safety, but there was another reason. Um, here he is president and he's going to the theater on Good Friday, which is a holy day. And uh, it's considered to be, and he's going to a comedy. It's kind of frivolous. Um, uh, Washington is um, at that moment still in the in a in a in the ecstatic state after the um, battle uh, at Appomattox and the surrender of Lee and his army, um, and there's a k kind of holiday f atmosphere in the, in the town, and um, Lincoln wants nothing more than to go to the theater, be relieved, uh, to see a comedy. Uh, he can't get, really can't get anyone to go with him. Uh, he asks Grant. Grant's wife doesn't want to go. She doesn't like Mary. Um, and he goes down a list and uh, finally goes with the young couple who live in Lafayette Square, who are the daughter of a senator from New York and her husband, a major. Um, and um, it is Good Friday, and Lincoln is shot on Good Friday. And um, this um, and his death um, lead to Easter. And um, there was a popular feeling that uh, he had been martyred. Um, he had given his life, and he had, for the nation and, it, and for the cause. Um, he was... Um, considered to be Christ-like at that moment. So this man who had um, suffered in Shakespearean uh, phrase, in a Shakespearean phrase, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune all through his presidency, uh, the oscillations of popularity, been um, a smeared as Abraham Africanus the first in his reelection campaign appeared as though he would face certain defeat, uh, was excoriated in newspapers, um, was called a guerrilla by his general, was now America's Christ. Um, Lincoln was carried uh, from the theater, um, Ford's Theater, across the street to a boarding house, Peter, the Peterson House, and laid um, sideways across a bed in a small bedroom. Mary was there um, and uh, hysterical. And over time, the, there are doctors who cannot help him. Uh, and, and then men come and go. Um, and these are um, many of the great figures of the time of the Civil War, his cabinet members, Charles Sumner, the abolitionist uh, senator from Massachusetts, is by the bedside. Edwin Stanton hears the word uh, at his house. Uh, he's astonished. He rushes there and takes control of the government and maintains um, its uh, viability uh, through the entire crisis, stays up all night. Um, they learn that um, Seward has been the victim of an assassination attempt, has been stabbed multiple times. Um, they don't know who else might be attacked. Um, there's still an atmosphere of um, chaos and of menace. Um, and no one knows how far and how deep this conspiracy goes. Um, and there are many of these great figures of, of, in the government standing around this bed as Lincoln is um, wheezing his last breaths. Sometime later, Charles Dickens comes to Washington. 
and he has dinner with Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, and Charles Sumner. And Dickens says it was the greatest evening of his life because for hours they recounted to him in minute detail what it was like to sit around the bed of Abraham Lincoln as he died and the sound of his breath as it passed away. And for the great dramatic novelist, for Dickens, it was the greatest scene of them all. Lincoln, um, when he was a congressman, uh, served for one term. Um, he was obscure. No one paid much attention to him. Um, and he lived in a boarding house, um, a row of boarding houses that um, faced the Capitol, directly across from the Capitol. On that site now is the Library of Congress. Um, the particular boarding house he lived in was known as Abolition House, informally. It's where a number of the most prominent abolitionist congressmen lived and where they frequented. Um, a lot of things happened to him then, and it's relevant to what happens in terms of emancipation in the District of Columbia later when he's president. Uh, slave hunters come in the house, and they arrest uh, waiters who they claim are fugitive slaves, and drag them away. Um, it, uh, the, the house is a kind of underground railroad. Um, and Lincoln, at the end of his uh, term as congressman, with the advice of um, some of these uh, abolitionist figures, like Joshua Giddings of Ohio, uh, uh, writes a bill for emancipation in the District of Columbia. It's gradual emancipation, it's compensated emancipation, it's emancipation. Uh, it's what he thinks is possible. It receives not a single hearing. He is denounced in the Senate by John C. Calhoun, but not by name. It is the most notable instance of a mention of Lincoln uh, in his period as uh, a congressman. Flash forward. Um, uh, Lincoln um, declares emancipation in the District of Columbia as president. It's compensated emancipation. The slaveholders in Washington are compensated, the federal government pays, and the slaves are freed. And to this day, in the District of Columbia, this is a holiday in Washington. 